give a basic introduction for CalFAD because it's a big group who may be not using CalFAD uh, pro software in general. And uh, my background is that, uh, well, I started with physical metallurgy, it was called at that time, at KTH, uh, almost 50 years ago. And I had a very nice professor, Matt Sillet, who was introduction to this. And I also got uh, very interested in microstructures because uh, they are very beautiful. If you choose the right material, you have a copper bronze here, you have a copper oxygen, and this is a classical steel. I will come back a bit to to describe um, what you see there. And I worked with Thermocalc for about 30 years. Uh, I retired 10 years ago, a bit more, and then I started writing Open Calfad because I wanted to continue with modeling. So that is what we are going to present a bit, some of the lectures here, and I will talk about what is available. Uh, when you deal with thermodynamics, uh, you have always to deal with entropy. So one of the basic parts when you model materials is that you have a configurational entropy. And uh, Boltzmann uh, described how that should be calculated and there has been long discussions on, on improving, well, how, impl how to implement this for different kinds of, of uh, materials and alloys. <laughs> um, in addition to the entropy, you have, of course, bonding energies between the atoms, and they can be either positive or negative, so they like to be together or not. And um, that is what we try to do in the CalFAD technique, that you describe the, your entropy, and you describe the type of uh, bonding you have between the atoms in different kinds of structures. And the very simple di phase diagram, when you have that kind of models for the different phases, you can uh, calculate phase diagrams where you minimize the um, Gibbs energy for the different phases together. And this is a copper um, silver system where you have very, it's a just a single FCC phase which is stable for the pure elements. And you have a uh, liquid in the middle at high temperature. And uh, the lines in this type of phase diagram, it's actually a solubility line. So this gives the composition of the liquid in, comp in equilibrium with the solid. And uh, these are, uh, silver and copper doesn't like to be together. So, so they separate into two, they have the same crystal structure, but they don't uh, mix. So you have a two phase region in the solid state where the silver rich and the copper rich uh, FCC phase. And uh, normally you learn a little about phase diagrams when you when you study material science because they give you an overview of what is kind of happening when you hit, change composition and you change temperature. But um, with the CALFA technique you give an equation for the different Gibbs energies and then you can calculate what would be a multi-component system and I will come back to how to describe uh, what is called an isoplet diagram and how you can understand that because it, isoplets are, are not really very common um, in teaching anyway. Uh, the relation with the Gibbs energies is that if you take, for example, a temperature here, you have a Gibbs energy curve for the liquid, you have a Gibbs energy curve for the FCC phase, and here you see the miscibility gap that uh, they don't like to, it prefers to separate into two phases, one with the composition silver rich here and one copper rich here. And at this temperature, the liquid is not stable, so it is above the, the solid phases. And you have also chemical potential, which is important. And that is basically the tangent uh, curve here. So the end points of this is the chemical potential of copper and chemical potential of silver in this uh, at this temperature. And if you go up in temperature, the liquid becomes stable. So you have still the miscibility gap in the FCC phase, but the liquid is now more stable. So you have one tangent on the 
copper ridge side and one tangent on the silver ridge side, and you have uh, these two uh, tangent curves with the chemical potentials. So th this is the basic technique. You describe your, your Gibbs energies and you can calculate the equilibrium by minimizing the Gibbs energy for the values of temperature and composition you have. And then, of course, uh, there are other problems. You go to higher order systems, you may have uh, other phases which uh, elements which have other phases which are stable, like DCC or HCP or uh, BCT structures. And, and when you want to mix them, you need to have the difference for, the, for each pure element, you need to have the difference in, in Gibbs energy between the different structures, and those are, are called lattice stabilities, and they are included in the database. So when you can want to calculate, you will have to see how pref preference for the different elements in the different phases. And when you change composition and temperature, the, all of this changes. So this is what you minimize in your calculating the diagrams. So to a bit more complex system, if you take iron aluminium, iron dissolves quite a lot of aluminium in the BCC structure, and you have also magnetic transition. So you have a ferromagnetic state at low temperature, a paramagnetic at high temperature. You have an ordering to a B2 structure, which is this, where you have a central atom, which is preferred to be different from the other ones. And at low temperature, you can have a BDO3 structure, which is even more complicated. Well, it's still basically a BCC lattice, but uh, the atoms prefer different positions in the BCC lattice. So when you do modeling of the different phases, you have also some intermetallic phases with other structures. But uh, the complicated phase to model here is, is the, all these radians in the BCC phase, including the magnetic transition. There is also, of course, a small FCC region here for, for, the, for the pure iron. And aluminium is also FCC, but uh, in between here, you don't have any FCC structure. So all of this are assessed according to experimental data, and you put it in a database, and from that on, you can recalculate these types of diagrams. And if you look uh, more in detail, if you take 30% of uh, aluminium in the BCC structure and calculate varying, sorry, varying just the temperature, you can see the different ordering here. This is the DO3 structure where you have mainly iron in two sub in one sublattice. You have a little less iron in another sublattice, and you have two sublattices with mainly aluminium. And then at some temperature here, the DO3 structure is known. Well, you have a magnetic transition here. You can see the heat capacity curve here. The peak here is the magnetic tra transition, where you cross the line temperature here. Then you have a, a small jump when you cross from the DO3 to the B2 structure. And this is where you cross from the uh, B2 structure to the A2 structure, the pure disordered BCC. And these are the constituent fractions in the different sublattices. So you have a bit, sometimes the modeling is a bit complicated. And that is basically what is interest, interests me to do the modeling of um, different types of structures. And the modeling is basically setting up a function like this. You have a Gibbs energy for the phase, and then you have what we, these are the basically lattice stabilities, uh, how stable the pure element is in where well, you have different kinds of ordering on, on the different sublattices. This is your configurational entropy, which depends. Uh, Calfa normally use uh, as random mixing on each sublattice, but having sublattices. Uh, you have a weight factor depending on, on the um, number of sites. It is, um, each sublattice basically has a uh, fractions, sums up to unity. And then you have um, excess term, which depends on the bo bonding of the tips and elements. And then you have a physical contribution like the magnetic 
And then you can go on to do other systems. You have uh, interstitials, like when you have carbon in, in steels, uh, you can go phase diagrams for the iron carbon system, a stable and metastable one. You can add chromium and calculate the iron chromium nickel system, where you have intermetallic phases like a sigma phase, which you also describe with the different types of ordering. Here you don't have any disordered state. It, it, sigma is never completely disordered, but it has always some structures. And then one can go on to describe uh, super alloys like aluminium, nickel aluminium, and uh, you have an L12 phase, which is the important one when you want to have a high phases which are stable at high temperature and, and strong. The B2 structure is even more stable, but it has less mechanic, good mechanical properties. And then you can go on to higher order system. This is a high speed steel with some five or six elements. Uh, and here now phase diagrams is becoming a bit complicated. So I will come back to describe how the, we describe the um, isoplate phase diagram. This is called a property diagram. So you just change one variable here, you change the temperature and you can see which phases are stable at the different temperatures. And you have a liquid at high temperature, you have a small region with the BCC phase stable and then comes the FCC phase. And then BCC comes back at low temperature and you have various carbides forming. And when you do a calculation like this, you can look at various properties. This is the amount of phases. This is the composition of a specific phase. Uh, this is the cubic carbide, which is actually an FCC lattice, but you have mainly carbon in, in, the, um, in the second sub lattice. And you can see uh, the composition of that phase uh, varying the temperature. And this uh, I was told was interesting for doing. I don't really deal with phase transformations, but uh, when you deal with phase transformation, you like to know how stable other phases are relative to the ones you have. And this is a calculation showing the driving force for forming different phases uh, varying the temperature. Uh, all these curves are from one calculation. You calculate one range and then you can plot different properties from that one. So this shows the, the curve here is the liquid phase. It becomes it's stable up here, but then it disappears. And you have the BCC phase, which becomes stable here, then it disappears and then it comes back here. So you, one can one can understand a bit. How the different phases relates and of course the, you don't measure the metastable phases normally. So this is extrapolated from uh, properties you can measure. And I worked in France now for 10 years and I've been in collaboration with the CEA and I've been working with modeling nuclear fuels, which are quite complicated, where you have uranium, zirconium, plutonium and all kinds of horrible elements uh, dissolving in what is normally uh, C1 structure where you have interstitial, you have an oxygen sublattice and you have an interstitial sublattice. So there is quite a lot of work to do on the modeling. And um, I would like to say, emphasize that software is never better than the database you're working with. The, all, all these results depend on how good database you have. And uh, that is uh, what this the strength of, of these commercial companies like Thermocalc or FactSage. They have spent 20 or 30 years developing databases. And, and uh, the problem I found that they don't like to change models because if you change a model, you have to reassess the database. And then uh, that takes time. Um, so one now talk a lot about DFT calculations for speeding up assessment work, but DFT basically gives you only the experimental data. Uh, I try to make a small sketch of, of uh, the structure of the software. I mean, you have the user interface where you give commands. Then from this one, you can calculate uh, single equilibria. You can do phase diagrams or property diagrams. And then you have this equilibrium calculation. The, the part here is actually the, the basic part of, of uh, OpenCalfad. And here you have the database which comes into the model package. 
and uh, you have input, various ways of input and the assessment part here is what what creates the database so you have to spend on time on, on doing the assessments and create the database for making nice diagrams for uh, real materials and my interest is basically in the bottom part here but uh, you cannot do modeling without having the rest and, uh, that's why i started with open calfas system so this I will now change to give an example on how an um, isoplet calculation works. And I will give it a tribute to Bo Jansson who wrote the first mapping routine with Thermocalc, that is almost 40 years ago. So an isoplet means that you calculate a diagram where you have one or more cost compositions fixed. And then the lines in the phase diagrams are not so easy to interpret like you have in the binary system where the lines are also solubility lines. I will take this iron chromium carbon system and this is an isoplet where I calculate with 13% chromium and varying carbon content and the temperature. So in this diagram you can only see which phases are stable in each region. So here you have liquid, here you would have liquid and FCC, here you have FCC and M7, and there is a very small two-phase, three-phase region in between here, uh, where the M7 carbide becomes stable. This is a single-phase region, and this was also a single-phase region. So here you can see the composition of the FCC phase in equilibrium with one other phase. But in this region, you don't know the amounts of the phases, you don't know chemical potentials or anything, but uh, it gives you an overview, a kind of map uh, of the diagram. And, and when you have drawn this diagram as it is, you don't really see much, uh, you cannot extract very much, but uh, when you have done it calculating, you can go in with a single calculation or, or a step calculation and find out much more. Um, so these are, are really useful for, for doing multi-component systems. This is how it looks when you have calculated a single equilibrium. So when we start doing this map, you start with a single point. Then you specify two axes. And then you say map and plot and you get a diagram. So I will explain a bit what is happening when the diagram is calculated. So we have started with this point here. Then when you give map command, it will look in some direction until it finds a new phase becoming stable. And here it finds the BCC becoming stable. And then it generates a start point from this a node point. And it has two direction, one in this high in carbon content and lower carbon content. And this has now follow the higher carbon content until it finds the limit of the axis we have defined. Then it will go in the other direction and here it finds a new phase table. It finds the M23 carbide. And then it will generate a new node point and this node point is very special because it has is an invariant one. So it has quite a lot of exits from it. Or it, will, it will store all these exits and then it will take one of them and that will, in this case it took the one where you have the M23 carbide amount zero. So it calculates a line here and here it finds another node point where actually the M7 carbide is no longer stable. And then it follows a line, continues follow a line where the uh, M23 carbide has zero amounts. And then it will follow where you have here points, it finds BCC phase. So it finds a three phase equilibrium and goes on this line. And this doesn't show up very well, but here it follows where the M23 carbide disappears. And then it will follow where the FCC phase is no longer stable. And here it will end at the invariant where we, we already found at this point it will follow the FCC disappearing in this region and then it will has finished all the points here but it will take it has another node point which it hasn't used here so it will continue here where the M7 carbide is no longer stable so on this side we have just FCC on this side we have FCC and M7 and here it stops because liquid becomes stable 
And then if we calculate a line where the M7 carbide um, is again zero, and then it will cover another line where the liquid has zero amounts, and then it will cover where the liquid is uh, uh, zero amount, and then it goes on like this, following the different where you have a zero amount of one of the phases. And here we again find this invariant equilibrium. And we have some more lines in equilibrium with the liquid. So this is the way the diagram is calculated. And finally, we have the invariant point here. So the program doesn't calculate anything in this region. It just follows the line where you have a zero amount of a certain phase. And I will have a look, but if you look at this point up here, this is how it works. It comes this line with liquid zero amount. Then it finds that BCC becomes stable. So it generates a node point here where you have three exits, one where BCC is stable in two direction, and then it continues in the liquid region. And actually, if you go back here, it went like this, and then it came back this way. So. Uh, it will come back here, find the same node point. It will take away the exit from this node point, and then it will continue this line down. And that is where, where it followed this line down here. So, and then we have the invariant. I will not explain the invariant, but you have a lot of exits from it, and, and you have to find out which one are in the plane of your calculation. So, if you take a multi-component like this with five system, five components, you cannot really say much about the phases except which one you have stable here. But you have a line here, which is where the FCC phase disappears. So FCC is stable in this region. And you have another line here, which says where the BCC phase has zero amounts. So you have BCC phase in the, in below this temperature. And you can find out, for example, where the HCP carbide is stable. That, that will be limited by those points here. So that is how a phase isoplate calculation is calculated. And it is not direct. It is useful for finding out if you want to avoid certain phases or if you want to see what is happening when, when you change things in the system. But then for details, you have to go into, you have the software, you have the database, you can calculate any point inside this diagram and, and get more information. I don't really deal with simulations, but, but uh, of course, uh, the reason for doing this kind of uh, assessments is that you want to understand what is happening when, when you heat, treat, or change your composition of the phases. So uh, I have um, tried to exp uh, include what uh, you can use uh, thermodynamic calculations to understand what is happening, for example, when you try to develop steels. People have de developed uh, different kinds of steels for a long time, but without that really understanding things. But uh, one can go back to this kind of microstructure where you have different phases stable. You have a uh, this is a low alloy steel. You have little manganese, one percent, little silica, and, and you vary the carbon content. And, and the properties of steel is very dependent on how you heat treat and on how you modify the, the um, cooling, for, for example. So for, for this type of uh, composition, you, you can calculate a phase diagram like this. This is an isoplet again, um, where you have an FCC region here. You have FCC, BCC, uh, ferrite carbide here, and you have a car graphite or uh, cementite, so which is stable at higher carbon content. So this is a equilibrium phase diagram. You can also calculate what is known a para equilibrium phase diagram. In this para equilibrium, you assume that carbon is the only element which can diffuse. You assume that manganese, uh, magnesium and silica uh, remains uh, fixed, uh, like you had, a, they were not uh, moving in the system. So you can calculate uh, what is the equilibrium if only carbon diffuses, because carbon can, is an interstitial element and it can diffuse very quickly. 
And you could see in this microstructure there is uh, some remains or this kind of lines here are the remains of the austenite structure you had at high temperature. This was the initial state. So initially at high temperature here you would have austenite with grain boundaries like this. And when you cool it, and if you cool it down below here, you will see ferrite forming along the grain boundaries. And those are all the light structures you have here. I try to emphasize where you, where you actually get the ferrite forming. It forms f first in the grain boundaries because there you have a distorted structure. It's easier, easier to knuckle Then you form a perlite when you come down to this temperature because cementite is stable. And perlite, it looks like a single face here, but it's actually a, a lamellar structure with ferrite and cementite. Um, which I try to emphasize. Then at the end, if you cool fast enough, you can get, go below what is called a D0 line where you have the same Gibbs energy for the ferrite and the austenite, independent of the composition. And then you can form martensite, which is the hard structure here. And that is what gives you a, a strong uh, material. It's a bit too brittle by itself, but, but one can heat treat it a bit afterwards to make it a bit softer. And this structure is actually not very good because it, you have cooled it a bit too slow. You should, you normally you want only martensite when you want to harden it. So this has been known for a long year, long time, but uh, of course they didn't really understand what they were doing, except that you get a good result from varying heat treatment and varying the cooling temperature for it. And this you do just with dynamics. You have no basically kinetics, except that you assume that carbon can diffuse much faster than the other elements. But uh, I also have an example where, where I'm using a, a very simple kinetic model. And I, I go back to this aluminium nickel uh, alloy where you have turbine blades in the jet engines here. And, and the turbine blades here are uh, in a very difficult situation. The, when you are up in the air, the engine is working and you have very high temperature in this region and then the plane will go down and you exit and the, everything cools down and then the plane goes up again. So this uh, turbine blades here, they always uh, circulate in temperature, high temperature, low temperature. And there are very few materials which can resist such kind of uh, bad treatment without cracking. But uh, this aluminium L12 phase in the aluminium nickel phase has very good properties both at high and low temperatures. But they also always they have also corrosion problems and you have I mean they live in a use work in a very strange uh, region down here. So, for example, to improve the corrosion resistance, you have uh, sulfur and oxygen corroding the blades here. Sometimes platinum is, is, allowed, is used for coating of, of these turbine blades. And I try to simulate what is happening during this kind of uh, coating. So, no, aluminium oxide is always a good protection for, for um, uh, corrosion. And this is not part of the open CalFAD system, but there is a software interface to open CalFAD where you can write a simulation program and then you can uh, try to see what is happening with time. Thermodynamics doesn't include time. Time is something you have to add on uh, externally from thermodynamics. So I set up a grid where you can, each of these represent where you have uh, different composition and you can have a movement of the atoms between these grains. And on this side I have a platinum rich surface and then this kind is the interior of the turbine blade where you have no, basically no platinum originally. And 800 Celsius is about the temperature where you have uh, are up in the air when the pl plane is uh, moving from one city to another one. So I set up a composition profile where you have mainly nickel and aluminium in the center of the turbine blade and you have mainly platinum and I took the same aluminium content in, in the surface also. 
and the nickel disappear in the surface. And this is the composition. You have 90% uh, nickel here, 10% aluminium. You have 85 platinum and, and little, little nickel. These are the chemical potentials. The chemical potentials are what is driving the diffusion. If uh, So you see nickel here as a high chemical potential than in the surface. So nickel will try to move to the surface. Aluminium also has a very high lower platinum decreases the aluminum chemical potential of aluminium very lot much so you have a strong jump in the chemical potential of aluminium. So this is the initial profile. And then you let time pass and you, you can see what happening when you change the time steps here. Uh, I don't have the times because my, my mobilities of the elements are, are just invented, so uh, I cannot really say what is happening, uh, how long time this works. But you can see here the profile of aluminium, where the aluminium tries to move to, to the platinum rich side because it has lower chemical potential. Of course, nickel and, and platinum also diffuses, but the, the composition profile of, of the aluminium is the interesting one. Here you have now uh, it has decreased quite a lot in, in the central part of the turbine blade but, and it goes to the surface. This is what is happening with the time. And uh, I stopped at 50,000 time steps and you can see the chemical potentials at the end. Uh, aluminium is almost horizontal, so there is, uh, but you still have a gradient in composition because uh, the Aluminium chemical potential is affected by the nickel and platinum. Um, I also did this uh, open calfat has a facility to calculate an equilibrium in a parallel. So there is an open MP system where you can compile with it. And I calculate this twice, one with uh, 12 threads so, uh, using six CPUs. And uh, this is the CPU time for this uh, simulation. I had exactly the same results, of course, but the clock cycles decrease quite a lot when, when you calculate in parallel. Um, basically, this is the maximum you can get. Uh, having 12 processes, I, I can get one sixth of the computational time. And this has been uh, used actually in, in some applications. And, uh, and it seems to work quite well. And I think OpenCalfad is, for the moment at least, the, the only software which can do this kind of calculation in parallel. So this is a flow chart of, of the actual simulation program. You read in the database, set up the grid, you calculate the initial equilibria in all grid points, you take a step in time, you have a diffusion which generates new compositions or grid points. If the change in composition is small, you have reached the equilibrium state. If it is not small, then you can do parallel calculation of all the equilibria in all the grid points. And uh, if you have, you normally you set a maximum number of grid points or uh, steps you want to take. If you have increased, reached the maximum, you stop. Otherwise, you go back and take a new step in time, calculate new diffusion, check if you reach the equilibrium and, and go on. So this is the loop for, for the simulation. Uh, and the open CalFAD is the one where you can do this calculation here. And the, this part is the kinetic. Uh, and I know people doing simulation, uh, finite element methods or whatever, they, they always complain that calculation in thermodynamics takes too long time. So I, I hope they can find that parallel calculation can actually help them. And uh, I did a one dimensional simulation, but you can, this is no problem to go on to higher dim the, uh, orders. But of course, uh, nucleation and, and moving boundaries are more. I, my calculation was for a single uh, phase structure. So this is a bit background of CALFAD and what you can do with it and what you can use it for. And my working in this field for 40 years, uh, I mean, you have specialists doing very good things on 
understanding particular phenomena in, in materials. But I see computational thermodynamics as a tool to bridge all, all these separate efforts in, into one uh, forge. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay. I kept Thank the time.